And this is uh, the heart of Uppsala. And you're most welcome. Let me know if, if you want to visit. Um, it's an old city and we have famous people like Linnaeus, Celsius and Rudbeck. Rudbeck was the, one of the first discoverers of the lymphatic system. And you know about Linnaeus who named plants and Celsius with a thermometer. So um, we don't have any sea, we have a river, water, that's my interest now, water with more or less protein in it, that is edema. So I will talk today about the role of edema in disease processes. And when you say edema, you know that it's something in a tissue that makes it swollen, maybe red, um, it's, however, not enough. You need to know what is constituting the edema. So it's important to distinguish between protein-poor edema and protein-rich edema. So protein-poor edema um, means that it's water from the blood that goes out into the circulation, but not a lot of the protein constituents in blood. And fluid can go across the vessel wall without any openings or junctions or any pores forming. So this occurs in um, diseases which are characterized by changes in hydrostatic or oncotic pressures. And you, s you can see it in a number of systemic diseases um, where protein concentrations uh, go down, for example, uh, malnutrition, kidney and liver diseases. And many people experience it when they fly, for example, and their extremities get swollen. This is not the type of edema that I will talk about. I will talk about protein-rich edema, which occurs in diseases in a local um, uh, tissue engaged in diseases such as cancer, retinopathies, or chronic inflammatory conditions. Um, and extravasation of inflammatory cells, so inflammation is often accompanying both types of um, edema, especially when they become chronic. So protein-rich edema requires for endothelial junctions to partially dissociate. So normally in a healthy organ, blood vessel junctions are sealed, permeability is low, and blood does not leak through the vessel wall and into the tissue. But in conjunction with some kind of stimulation, either acute or chronic, there are discrete gaps formed um, between the endothelial cells at the junctions. And permeability goes up and leakage goes up. And this is either transient in acute inflammation from a mosquito bite, for example, or these gaps can remain chronically in case of uh, chronic inflammation, rheumatoid arthritis, for example. In cancer, the morphology of the vasculature changes drastically, as you know. And here, gaps between endothelial cells may um, be very different, larger. They may come and go. So there may be uh, phases of increased uh, permeability, but dependent on these gaps, um, it may also cease with, with time. And in a healthy tissue, when we look at the different types of vessels, arteries, capillaries, and veins, and I'm sure you know that capillaries are in most organs, the most abundant type of uh, vessel. And here is where a lot of exchange occurs with the surrounding tissue. So leakage is established <clears throat> only in some of the uh, vasculature, in the pre-vanular capillaries and in post-capillary venules. So protein-rich edema does not occur in the arterial bed. Here is where instead the protein-poor edema is formed. So it's important to know which type of edema that you are um, going to study 
and to know from which type of vessel is this edema established. So the gaps that are formed between endothelial cells cannot be seen in light microscopy. You can see them in transmission EM. Here you see examples of that. And here is a scanning EM where you see that the endothelial cells don't lose their contact. This cell is still holding on to the adjacent cell. You can see these finger-like projections. <clears throat> So to understand how these gaps are formed is the key to try and seal junctions because that has an impact on disease progression. And to understand how the gaps are formed, it's important to know that endothelial cells don't meet end to end as do epithelial cells. They have these overlapping flaps and the flaps are held together by different types of junctions, tight junctions, and adherence junctions. And here you see an um, EM, transmission EM picture from Donald McDonald of adherence and tight junctions. And at the tight junctions closer to the luminal side, the plasma membranes are um, very close and even fused. <clears throat> In conjunction with some kind of stimulation, it could be vascular endothelial growth factors, inflammatory cytokines, or other agonists, these overlapping flaps withdrawn. But as I said, the adjacent cells keep hold of each other through these finger-like uh, projections. And tight junctions may still remain at the fingertips. As indicated in this, um, transmission EM picture um, of a vessel stimulated with a leakage agonist. But along the <clears throat> finger part of the projection, uh, junctions have dissolved. And in particular, a lot of studies um, have uh, resulted in um, fairly um, extensive understanding of what happens to adherence junctions. So in the resting stage, we have the tight junctions where endothelial cell plasma membranes are very close. And we have the adherence junctions, and they consist of a protein called vascular endothelial cadherin, VE cadherin, <clears throat> which forms um, complexes between endothelial cells, homophilic complexes. And they have a number of partners, intracellular partners, catenins, that um, connect to uh, the act inside the skeleton. And um, there's also phosphatases and receptors associated with B cadherin, so multi protein complexes here at the adherence junctions. And then in conjunction with um, a stimulation, we're not quite sure what happens to the tight junctions. They may dissolve or move laterally along the finger, but at the tip, as I said, they will remain um, intact. But the adherence junctions dissolve. The adherence becomes either internalized, as shown on this part, or recycles. And then eventually the complexes are re established. And a number of components have been described that are important for keeping the uh, junctions uh, closed, like angiopoietin 1, for example. And a number of agonists have been described that mediate opening of the junctions or disintegration of um, of the adherence junctions, such as VEGF or inflammatory cytokines. So I mentioned the leakage agonists, and they seem to act in similar manners, um, but very rarely do people compare the effects of the one VEGF, for example, to the other inflammatory cytokines. So we have studied how does VEGF vascular endothelial growth factor induce um, this uh, integration of adherence junctions as a, as a key to try and, and 
generate tools to to uh, control this opening or seal junctions. And a pathway that is essential for leakage to become established involves signaling from VEGF receptor 2 to SARC or SARC family kinases. And one pathway goes directly to weak adherence, so SARC family kinases um, phosphorylate weak adherence. But SARC family kinases may also work on uh, the Rho family of GTPases or on focal adhesion kinase. And all of that leads to rearrangements of the cytoskeleton pulling on junctions or phosphorylation of weak adherin and internalization of weak adherin and thereby this leakage um, induction. Uh, ENOS and generation of nitric oxide is also part of it. And as you probably know, NO regulates the, the degree of vessel contraction and um, dilation. However, NO also acts directly on the adherin. Very interesting molecule. So uh, VEGF receptor 2 phosphorylates the adherin through activation of SARC family kinases. So a number of phosphorylation sites have been described. And I will mention uh, in particular this 685 tyrosine, which has been associated with um, this integration of adherence junctions. And in a paper by Orson Eagle and Elisabeth Dejana a number of years ago, they showed very nicely that this, this is another, uh, no, this is 685, sorry. So this phosphorylation site was induced in veins, but not in arteries. Uh, even though weak adherent is expressed in all types of vessels. So it's well known from this and other studies that phosphorylation of weak adherent is induced in a flow dependent manner, flow being very different between arteries and veins. So our contribution has involved um, exploiting this signaling chain from VEGF receptor 2 to SARC and phosphorylation of B adherin. And we have studied permeability in mouse models in vivo by injecting various tracers in the tail vein of mice, uh, microspheres in this case. And then we've studied different organs. And here, for example, the, the trachea. So we have mutated each step in this pathway and looked at what is the consequence for passage of molecules um, across the vessel wall. So here you see the trachea with the cartilage ring. So the, the trachea is, is turned 90 degrees. You can see where the microspheres have across the vessel wall in response to, to VEGF injection. So they become lodged uh, under the basement membrane. And um, in a mutant where this 9 for 9 phosphorylation site is, is uh, replaced with phenylalanine, leakage does not occur on much less as um, quantified here. However, when histamine is used instead, to induce leakage. We see that both the wild type mouse and the mutant mouse leak to the same extent. And we can also show in vivo uh, that when wild type vessels are exposed to VEGF and there's leakage, leakage here is in red, that the weak adherent positive junctions change from a linear to this uh, jagged pattern. However, when VEGF receptor 2 is mutated from tyrosine to phenylalanine at the site, the junctions remain linear, which is quantified here. So we can seal junctions to VEGF induced macromolecular leakage in this genetic model. 
And then, of course, we want to understand what is the consequence for disease. So we've exposed this mouse and Y949 F mouse to a number of different disease models and uh, try to, to draw conclusions about how edema affects uh, disease progression. And one of the diseases that we're interested in is, of course, cancer. And does leakage occur in cancer, you may ask? Well, from this paper here, um, you can see how cancer, different cancer uh, forms are associated with an increase in um, interstitial pressure. You can see that for some, the N is low, renal cancer, but for others, quite a number of patients have been examined. And you can see that the interstitial pressure is very much increased compared to normal tissue. And what is the consequence then of this um, increase in um, permeability and the buildup of the interstitial uh, pressure? Well, it is associated with poor perfusion because the vessels are constricted, both the blood vessels and the lymphatic vasculature. Um, will experience um, a compression from the high interstitial pressure and circulation will go down. And the extracellular matrix becomes remodeled. And this has consequences for disease progression and for delivery of therapeutics. So the edema as such, which everyone knows is there, it's been overlooked as a component to therapeutically address and try to suppress. So we have exploited genetic models for the different steps in this pathway from VEGF receptor 2 to VE cadherin, and then challenged the mice with different types of tumors. And um, here is an example of a melanoma, B16F10. We don't see much of an effect on primary tumor growth in these different models, except for if the tumors become really large. Um, but we can see that um, leakage is down in the Y949 uh, mouse. So here, this is melanoma, but this is a neuroendocrine uh, tumor, RIPTAG. And we've injected these mice uh, with microspheres, and then we've taken the tumors and we've counted how, what extent are there microspheres uh, in, in the perivascular uh, tissue. And here you see the quantification, and there's a significant decrease when vessels are sealed for VEGF induced leakage. And importantly, even though primary tumor growth is not uh, decrease, the metastatic spread seems to be uh, much less. And we have looked in different compartments. This is the neuroendocrine tumors again, uh, metastasizing to the liver. And we can tell that this is really a metastasis because they express SV40 large T and they grow. And the tumor, the meta metastatic tumor burden is decreased in this Y949F mutant mouse. Then, of course, we were interested in what is the effect of sealing the junctions with regard to inflammation in the tumors. And surprisingly, from the analysis that we've done this far, we don't see much of an effect of inflammation. So even though we stop leakage to macromolecules, we don't seem to affect inflammation when we look at CD45, F480, or um, macrophage mannose receptors, which will, as you can read here, um, visualize different types of um, inflammatory cells. So the um, inflammatory burden does not seem to be affected by this genetic sealing of um, endothelial junctions. So other diseases uh, where leakage and edema plays an in considerable role um, and is part of the disease spectrum are um, retinopathies, age-related macular degeneration and um, diabetic macular edema. And the macula, as you know, is where the 
optic nerve, the region around the um, entrance of the optic nerve where the retinal um, epithelial cells are very uh, highly concentrated. So the sharp vision uh, relies on the macula. And when the macula becomes um, affected in these diseases, it's swollen and loses its um, ability to transmit light signals. So uh, the wet form of um, uh, AMD is a major cause, if not the major cause of blindness in the Western world. And diabetes, uh, of course, is also responsible for vision loss due to a number of changes in the retina, including edema. So we are uh, challenging our mouse models with different types of um, retinal um, challenges, uh, high oxygen, but also laser-induced wounding. But I will show a few data from um, the OIR um, challenges of uh, our mouse models. So here you put the mouse pups into high oxygen uh, at P7 together with their mother, and that will suppress VEGF production. And then when you take the mice out at P12, this will be experienced as a relative hypoxia, leading to a huge increase in VEGF production and um, proliferation of um, endothelial cells. So again, we use these different models with the Y949F mutation and also removing this adapter molecule, TSAT, T cell specific adapter. So um, in the analysis then that we do at uh, P19, P20, we see that in the absence of this 949 phosphocyte, tuft formation is reduced. And also when we block expression of the adapter molecule TSAT, we see that tuft formation is reduced. And this is accompanied by reduced leakage. So what we do to the right here is that we inject microspheres in the circulation and then we count microspheres that are outside the vessels in the retina. And you can see the significant decrease in mice expressing the mutant VEGF receptor 2 in uh, leakage. So leakage is affected, but also angiogenesis in um, this type of disease challenge. But again, inflammation, surprisingly, is not affected. So in these uh, retinas, uh, uh, CD68 and CD45, positive cells are similar between a mutant and a wild type. So that's an enigma that sort of remains and I'm trying to understand why is inflammation not affected. The third disease model that I will show you is a myocardial infarction. And of course, you know a lot about uh, that and edema in conjunction with infarction here, um, not from us, but from another lab where um, Evans Blue, uh, which forms a complex with albumin. Uh, so what we, we're looking at here is um, albumin uh, extravasating in the um, apex, which is a transient effect. So after two days, uh, challenging the mice uh, with um, a transient ligation. So it, this is um, ischemia reperfusion. But uh, the um, leakage peaks at 48 hours, and by 72 hours, it's, it's down. And of course, um, this microvascular leakage is bad for the heart. And there's a correlation between the ejection fraction decrease and the leakage extent. And also, the volume that remains in the left uh, ventricle uh, increases with leakage. 
So we uh, did permanent ligation of uh, the left coronary ascending, um, descending artery. And there was no difference between the Y949F and wild type mice in the heart size or in the infarct size. But what you can see here is that with this mutation, uh, the ejection fraction remained quite okay. Uh, it was similar between the mutant and the wild type before infarction and after infarction better in the mutant. And importantly, when mice were exposed to these quite large infarcts, um, the mutant mice survived better. And we could tell that there was edema formed um, because of the left ventricular mass, which was lower in the mutant than in the wild type. And we also looked at um, fibrinogen in the tissue, which was lower in the mutant. But again, what exactly happens to inflammation? We see that um, myeloperoxidase production is down in the mutant, and myeloperoxidase, MPO, is produced by neutrophils. But we did not get a clear reduction in LY6G positive cells. And the um, peripheral counts of all kinds of blood cells were not significantly different between the mutant and the wild type uh, mice. So uh, we conclude that suppressing leakage and edema slows down progression of a number of diseases, cancer, retinopathy, and myocardial events. But we don't understand what the role is for inflammation. We uh, are now going to dissect the effect of edema. And uh, for sure, edema increases in decisional pressure. Um, most likely, it leads to obstruction of both the blood and the lymphatic vasculature, but that has not really been examined extensively. And it also alters the micro environment. The inflammatory profile, strangely enough, does not seem to be affected, but the immune profile is altered, at least in cancer. So one way to study inflammatory cell events is by a two photon microscopy. So here you see the red blood cells and the bigger inflammatory cells traveling in the vasculature. And we have injected, this is in the skin, in the dermis. So we have injected VEGF to induce leakage. And if you look up here, you see the inflammatory cells collecting at a site of leakage. So it's very exciting to look at these types of movies where you see how the inflammatory cells get stuck at the sites of leakage and seem to linger there. If they actually go through, is something we will uh, focus on. So is it possible to suppress leakage? Is this druggable? So people have looked extensively at Stark family kinases uh, and focused on um, SARC, C-SARC. But endothelial cells and most cells express several, many SARC family kinases. And endothelial cells express SARC, yes, and FIN with an overall very similar um, structure. So we asked whether the many events downstream of SARC, as indicated in this flow chart that you saw before, um, maybe these different effects are mediated through different SARC family kinases. And we probed the literature for what is known about SARC, yes, and FIN. What do they do? Are they acting in the same way, or are they, do they have different substrates? And surprisingly, very little is still known about the substrates for these cytoplasmic tyrosine kinases. Most is known for SARC, and a lot has been done on B-SARC, which lacks 
the C-terminal tail, so it's constitutively active. And in spite of that, you can find in the literature descriptions of hundreds of substrates for SARC. Only a few of them, the ones indicated here, have been validated. And they have to do with cell matrix adhesion and uh, cytoskeleton. So no substrates have been identified, for example, for the YES kinase. They have all SARC, YES, and FUN been constitutively eliminated um, in mice. And the surprise from these studies was that the phenotype was so limited. So knocking out SARC constitutively leads to osteoporosis. And knocking out FUN leads to an immune profile. And knocking out YES had no phenotype. And we were reading up on, on all of this literature, and we saw that there was also, were also studies associating SARC, yes, and FIN with vascular permeability from these constitutively um, knocked out mice. So here, um, David Rush's lab looked at experimental metastasis injecting tumor cells in the tail vein and looking at loading in the lung which was down in um, both SARC, yes, and FIN mice. So this is the first implication of SARC primary kinases in regulation of the vascular barrier. However, when we imported these mice, we noticed how crippled they were, hardly surviving uh, the postnatal stage. So instead, we knocked out uh, SARC, yes, and FUN in endothelial cells specifically, driven by uh, BE cadherin uh, CRE, CDH5 CRE. And what we saw then was interesting because in the absence of yes, vessels actually leak more. They leak more in postcapillary venules, in, in prevenular capillaries, and they leak more vigorously. So something happens with cell-cell contacts in the absence of yes. And um, we draw the conclusion here that uh, yes is not required for um, leakage to become established, but it is essential for junctional plasticity. So when you knock out uh, yes, you get stuff, stiff uh, junctions, like a stiff rubber band, so they cannot really close um, as in the wild type. But in the absence of SARC, the phenotype is dramatically different. Here, leakage is instead suppressed. So SARC and YES have opposing roles in regulation of um, the barrier. So we, we have looked at this, this, this data that I showed here were generated using live um, microscopy of the ear dermis, where we immobilize uh, the mouse ear under the objective lens of a two-photon uh, microscope. And then we inject VEGF with a fine glass capillary so to not cause uh, trauma. And um, we see with VEGF then leakage is established and not with PBS. And when we look at the leakage, here you see VEGF calm in red. It's a very prominent extravasation of this 2,000 kilodalton, a very large tracer at the distance from the injection. So for this to become established, yes, does not seem to be required. Instead, it's probably required for junctions to close properly for cell-cell contacts to become established. So how does YES act? Well, we looked at the phosphorylation of B cadherin, and here to the left you see the wild type, and this is the YES um, knockout. And we're looking at total B cadherin here. And in the wild type, when we immunostain for Y685 of B cadherin, uh, and this is the merge, so we see the, the, the white signal is prominent in veins, but not in arteries. Here you see only the, the green 685 stain. And when we do the same in the mutant, 
there is no uh, signal anymore. So uh, a very important substrate for yes is VE coherent. And we have looked at the different phosphorylation sites and they are all down in the absence of, e of yes. And they are also down in the absence of SARC, but much less so. And the major um, effect of this um, if phosphorylation by yes is an internalization of V-coherent. So in the absence of yes, V-coherent is not any longer internalized. This is an antibody feeding assay where you can see how much becomes internalized of V-coherent compared to uh, in the absence of uh, yes or absence of SART. And we have done this in vitro and in vivo with uh, just flow or um, in response to VEGF. And in all conditions, Yes, it's required for we can hear an internalization. So um, since the SARC family kinases are so similar in their organization, a SARC inhibitory drug will also inhibit yes and fin, and we're working on fin now, we don't know the phenotype. So you, you cannot target SARC specifically with tools at hand. Uh, because you will also affect yes, and they have opposite roles in regulation of uh, junctions. So with this presentation then of the different uh, disease models and the SART family kinase data, I've covered quite a number of years in the laboratory, and a number, many people have been um, involved. Um, I list some of them here. I probably forgot some my co-workers and collaborators and founders. So thank you so much for your attention.